This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, there's an update on the logging efforts by CAL FIRE and the Jackson Demonstration State Forest from Epic Attorney Matthew Simmons. We'll then switch gears and hear Unit 2 of the six units set from Project Drawdown's Climate Solution Series, along with an excerpted conversation between Executive Director Jonathan Foley and Dr. Naman Ramakuti on how to feed the world. But first, the news. I'm Max Pringle with these headlines. The latest job numbers from the government show that America's employers slowed their hiring in August in the face of rising interest rates, high inflation, and sluggish consumer spending. Economists said these factors weakened the outlook for the economy. The government reported that the economy added 315,000 jobs last month, down from 526,000 in July and below the average gain of the previous three months. The unemployment rate rose to 3.7 percent from a half-century low of 3.5 percent in July. President Biden delivered a pointed primetime speech Thursday in Philadelphia, warning in stark terms about the danger to democracy posed by former President Trump and his most ardent supporters. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. They do not believe in the rule of law. They do not recognize the will of the people. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. And they're working right now, as I speak, in state after state, to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, empowering election deniers to undermine democracy itself. Biden acknowledged that not all Republicans support Trump, but that Trumpism, he said, is now the dominant force in the party. Republican critics lambasted the speech. Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson told CNN that Biden was campaigning on dividing Americans. I think it was a political speech. It was a divisive speech, and that's not presidential. In his speech, he said uh, we should look at each other as Americans and not enemies, and yet he singled out a segment of Americans and said basically they're our enemy. Former President Trump, who's still pushing the falsehood that the 2020 election was stolen from him, plans a rally this weekend in the Scranton, Pennsylvania area as the midterm election campaign season begins in full swing. China has locked down the city of Chengdu in an attempt to contain a COVID-19 outbreak. The city recorded 157 new infections Thursday. Feature Story News' Patrick Falk reports from Beijing. Well, the lockdown in Chengdu is significant, not just because of the fact that it's a massive city. It's a city of 21 million people, the capital of Sichuan province. It is, in fact, the largest city to go under a lockdown since Shanghai went under a bruising two-month-long lockdown earlier this year. But also because Chengdu is a key manufacturing hub, home to lots of automakers and tech companies. And it accounts for 1.7 percent of China's GDP. So this is going to have very serious ramifications for China's economy. And it's coming after just just 157 cases. And that's Patrick Falk in Beijing. Today is the last day of voting in the race to replace outgoing British Prime Minister Boris Johnson as Conservative Party leader. FSN's Sally Patterson reports on the contest to become the UK's next leader. The Conservative leadership race is finally drawing to a close. Foreign Secretary Liz Truss is the bookie's favourite to win, promising major tax cuts to tackle the cost of living crisis. But former Chancellor Rishi Sunak has condemned her plans. The winner will be announced on Monday when MPs return from their summer recess. Sally Patterson, London. NASA will try again Saturday to launch its new moon rocket on a test flight. The first attempt on Monday was thwarted by engine problems. Managers said Tuesday that they're changing fueling procedures to deal with the issue. The 322-foot rocket remains on the pad at Florida's Kennedy Space Center with an unmanned capsule on top. The Space Launch System rocket, the most powerful ever built by NASA, will attempt to send the capsule around the moon and back. If successful, it will be the first capsule to fly to the moon since NASA's Apollo program in 1972. California lawmakers approved keeping the state's last nuclear power plant open for another five years. Governor Newsom and other supporters of the move said it will give the state a clean energy option 
while other renewable energy options have time to build out. Critics say nuclear power is unsafe. Eileen Alfandari has more. Newsom warned California could face blackouts if the reactors were retired on schedule. Napa Democrat Bill Dodd carried the bill in the state Senate. SB 846 will give us an essential tool in the toolbox to prevent widespread rolling blackouts and avoid significantly increased electricity prices from dirty carbon emitting out-of-state sources. Environmental groups cited the potential danger of extending the life of the reactor, which started operating in 1985. It is sited near earthquake faults both on and offshore. I'm Eileen Alfandari for Pacifica Radio. Many people saddled with medical debt are breathing a little easier now under a policy by the three major credit bureaus to not factor medical bills into their credit score calculations. Mark Richardson has more. The major credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, have voluntarily agreed to new regulations to lessen the impact unpaid medical bills can have on a person's ability to borrow. Patricia Kelmar, director of the health care campaigns for the Arizona Perg Education Fund, says it's unfair for consumers to have their credit score dinged over a debt they didn't ask for. We get sick. Somebody hits us with their car. We're faced with a lot of bills. So having the credit bureaus treat that kind of debt differently makes a lot of sense to us. Kelmar says the bureaus announced in July they will no longer list medical debts marked as paid or health care bills under $500 on a person's credit report. She adds the bureaus also promise that any new medical debt will not be listed until a year after it goes to collection. I'm Mark Richardson. Alameda County has agreed to ban rubber bullets, bean bags, and less lethal munitions for crowd control. It's part of a legal settlement after county sheriff's deputies fired bullets and injured two people protesting police brutality in 2020. Oakland police officers and Alameda County sheriff's deputies used tear gas to disperse demonstrators in Oakland during a June 2020 protest. The lawsuit claims deputies started indiscriminately firing rubber bullets into the crowd. Protesters had gathered for a George Floyd protest. The settlement restricts the sheriff's department's use of impact munitions and flash brand grenades to situations where it's necessary to defend against the threat to life or serious bodily injury or to bring a dangerous and unlawful situation under control. Sunny today in the Bay Area, highs in the 80s and 90s, lows tonight in the 60s in the central San Joaquin Valley, an excessive heat warning is in effect. High of 109 expected. I'm Max Pringle. Headlines return at noon and at 4. And please join us for the Pacifica Evening News at 6. A rude awakening is next. Welcome back. We are back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Last week, there were some technical difficulties with the live stream. I definitely want to apologize for, um, and we're in the process of fixing it. And please understand that our engineering department is in the process of also building our digital infrastructure from scratch with your donations and love. So I just want to let you know that. Now, with that said, here's Epic Attorney Matthew Simmons with an update on the CAL FIRE logging efforts. Uh, we heard from him last week, and it sounds like it's a go, folks. And uh, that is heartbreaking. But here's Matt Simmons with all the details. Let's take a listen. Yeah, thanks for having me back on. Um, so shortly after our conversation, uh, CAL FIRE announced that they were going to restart logging in Jackson Demonstration State Forest. Uh, they made this announcement without uh, informing the tribes or the public beforehand. Um, and everyone was really shocked and really outraged. You know, we we had felt like we were actually making some progress, you know, slow progress, but we were moving in the right direction. And then Cal Fire made this announcement and really, um, really broke a lot of the community trust that they had been building over the past several months. I mean, during this pause, I, I, it allowed for conversations to happen about what we wanted the future of this forest to look like. Um, but once they announced that they were going to restart logging, it sort of made all those conversations end and really made it hard to feel like we could ever trust them again going forward. Um, you know, CAL FIRE released its vision for the forest 
and we were all getting ready to like respond to it and think about what our vision is and maybe come together somewhere in the middle. But then they just went ahead with logging right after that. Uh, so in response, there was a series of rallies and protests held uh, in opposition to the plan to start logging again. There actually already was a rally plan for uh, this past Sunday um, in the forest. And so that rally, which had been, it had been planned as sort of a celebratory rally, like, hey, the logging still paused, you know, we're moving forward, things are going well, very quickly became more of a oppositional rally uh, with folks talking about how they, you know, still oppose these logging plans and didn't want to see them start back up again. Then on Monday, uh, there were protests through the streets of Fort Bragg. I think about 100 to 150 people marched from the town, ha town hall building in Fort Bragg to the CAL FIRE office in Fort Bragg, you know, waving signs, chanting, singing songs, uh, and just, you know, reminding CAL FIRE that there is still a lot of community opposition to their logging plans. I, I think CAL FIRE had sort of convinced themselves that, you know, they had made a few concessions and that everything would be fine if they announced the logging would start again, no one would really care. Um, and so we we had to make sure that they knew that wasn't the case. Uh, and so then to top it all off, on Tuesday uh, this past week, so August 30th, um, we had a protest in Sacramento. And so this was, I'd say about 50 people made the trek from the coast uh, over to Sacramento uh, and protested outside of the California Natural Resources Agency headquarters. Um, this is a big skyscraper. It's brand new. They moved in about a year ago. They share offices with CAL FIRE and state parks and basically everyone in the state government that works on uh, natural lands. Um, and we, you know, protested outside of their office and just made sure that the higher ups in Sacramento knew, you know, this isn't just a local thing in Mendocino County. It's something that it's a state forest and it's something that impacts all Californians. And so we're going to protest in Sacramento too, where you guys are making these decisions. Um, yeah. So that protest lasted about two hours. Um, it was, I was there. It was a really great time. People were coming up and asking us questions about uh, why we were protesting. You know, I think most people have never heard of Jackson demonstration state forest. And most people don't know that the state of California owns a bunch of, coast redwood trees and is logging them. Uh, and so every time we we meet someone new and inform us about, about this, they almost always are like, wait, what? They're doing what? Where? Right? And so, so much of our activism is just about getting the word out because once we do, um, people are won over pretty easily. At the end of the protest, uh, after sort of the general uh, rally had ended, um, a group of about six uh, movement elders decided to sit down in front of the front entrance to the California Natural Resources Agency uh, and block the door in protest of the logging. This was, you know, their decision to to really make a statement of how opposed they are to the logging. And eventually, in order to remove them, the state had to send some uh, uniformed officers. Uh, to take them away and, and book them. They were, you know, they it was totally nonviolent. They went without a fight. It was it was truly a, you know, nonviolent display of um, protest. And, you know, I, I, I really appreciate what they did. I think it, it just shows how committed everyone is to defending these trees and the sacred sites in the forest. Yeah, so that's that's where we are now. It's it's now Thursday. It's two days later. Um, there has not been, as far as I know, any response from Crowfoot either publicly or uh, to Chairman Hunter. Um, although I haven't checked with them uh, as of this morning yet. We talked yesterday. Cal Fire released a statement to the news. Uh, that was a bunch of word salad, um, but basically what they said was. After we're done logging these plans, then we can talk about a new management plan or a new vision. But these old plans were approved under the old plan, uh, under the old management plan. And so we're just going to log them now. Uh, and then we can we can talk with you afterwards. They also said they felt like they had done enough community outreach to to restart logging. Yeah. So in terms of next steps, 
unfortunately, these plans were approved back in 20, uh, very early 2020. And so the statute of limitations to, to sue to stop them has passed, uh, as far as I can tell, I, having done a lot of research on this. I think that, you know, everything that Cal Fire does going forward, they will be very heavily scrutinized and we will be looking for opportunities to uh, oppose them with legal action if they break the law. You know, I, I was really starting to hope that we would be able to come to some sort of compromise with Cal Fire and work out something with them that, you know, it's a compromise. So not everyone's perfectly happy, but we could we could move forward. And this move of theirs to restart logging has just really, really um, made me rethink that calculation. And, you know, so that's my message to Cal Fire mostly is you were you were on the right path. You were you were building trust. You were. I know it's it's hard for you to change your ways after uh, seventy years of managing the forest this way, uh, but you were you were on the right path, and they they veered from that path. And it wasn't just Cal Fire, you know. CNRA also knew this was going to happen. You know, they're the agency that sits above Cal Fire in the org chart, and so I'm I'm really disappointed in Secretary Crowfoot for um, deciding to move forward with these plans. We are caught up to the present. Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. that's, that's we're we're really it's it's all up in the air right now because they haven't actually so they announced the logging would start but they haven't actually gone back into the forest yet and so you know that's gonna be i can't i don't know what they'll do but i imagine some protesters might uh be watching them to see if they go back into the forest mm -hmm. and then uh, they have not reached out to the community or chairman hunter in response to these protests yet. So um, the ball is sort of in their court. Um, and I'm just going to continue pushing to educate the public and also our legislators. I think, you know, Cal Fire, Cal Fire can always fall back on the fact that they're operating on this old legislation that was passed in 1947. Um, and so until we change that legislation, I think that's a that's a real problem. And I think there will definitely be more protests until we do, uh, because you know the the pub, the community is not tired. The community is not going to you know stand down and just let this happen. Um, so I would expect more protests in the weeks to come, uh, particularly around the forest. You know, so many of our activists are local folks who just live, you know, they're neighbors to this forest, and so it's you know easy to protest there but i think we will definitely return to sacramento uh so that you know the higher ups and the leadership there know that we're still active um i i don't have dates for you yet on those protests they're currently being planned but i will certainly text you or sorry i'll certainly let uh i'll come back on the show and let everyone know when uh when they're announced and another way you can find out about uh, those protests uh, when they're, especially the ones that are, you know, permitted and allowed is on savejackson.org or pomolandback.com. Those are the two websites we've been using the most to let people know about this. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook. It's, again, just Save Jackson or Pomo Landback. Those are the two ways you can you can find us. And yeah, I, I really appreciate everyone who's listening and watching this because, you know, this is a state forest. And so everything that happens there is approved by uh, Governor Newsom, Secretary Crowfoot, our legislators that aren't doing anything to change the mandate. And I think everyone can agree that that needs to change. We'll switch gears and listen to unit two of the six unit set from Project Drawdown's Climate Solution Series, along with an excerpted conversation between Executive Director Jonathan Foley and Dr. Navin Ramakuti on how to feed the world. Let's take a listen.
Okay, so now we're going to look at how we can stop climate change and achieve what we call drawdown. Stopping climate change is necessary if we want to have a better future, because everything we do is connected back to climate change. Our water, our food, our air, our health, our security, our economy are all connected to what happens to weather and climate. So if we don't fix climate change, all the other things we care about in the future are going to be a lot harder. So we need to address climate change in order to have a better future with a prosperous economy, with resilience, equity, justice, and creativity, all the things we want demand that we address climate change. And that's what we're about. I work for something called Project Drawdown, which is the world's leading resource for climate solutions. We focus on the science we need to know to address climate change and then share it with the world. But why do we use that word drawdown? What does that even mean? Well, drawdown refers to a point in time, in the future, and it refers to the greenhouse gas levels in the atmosphere. Now, remember I told you in the last unit, greenhouse gases have been building up in the atmosphere. Here we are today at the 2020 levels. But then we can choose what happens next. On the path we're on now, we'll just continue to build up these gases, which will just warm the planet more, making the problem worse. But we don't have to do that we can bend the curve. Bending the curve on climate change means reversing the curve of growing greenhouse gases. And when we hit this point, the little blue dot here, that's the moment of drawdown. That's the moment when greenhouse gases stop climbing and they begin to go back down again into a healthier place. So drawdown is the moment in the future when greenhouse gas levels stabilize and stop climbing and then they start to steadily decline. And that's when we begin to stop climate change. At Project Drawdown, our job is to get the world to drawdown as quickly, safely, and equitably as possible. So how do we get there? Well, first, we're gonna to have to learn a little bit of science. It won't be too hard, but it's the stuff we really do need to know to kind of get forward on climate solutions. So first of all, what are greenhouse gases? Well, you've heard a little bit about this before, I'm sure. You know that greenhouse gases kind of lit in the sun's heat and they trap the Earth's heat as Earth is radiating out into outer space. So essentially they trap heat and the more gases means the more heat. And that's why the planet's warming up. Pretty simple. There's a little bit more to it. It turns out that Earth already had greenhouse gases before we came along. There were natural greenhouse gases like water vapor, a little bit of carbon dioxide, and a few other things that have been there for millions, if not billions, of years of Earth history. But then we've got these things we call anthropogenic greenhouse gases, or human-caused greenhouse gases, that we've been adding on top of that. And those include more carbon dioxide than was there before, more methane, more nitrous oxide, We've added chemicals that weren't even in the atmosphere before, like fluorinated gases, so-called chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, and so on, and many other gases that are impacting our climate. And we can actually see how they've been rising over the last 100, 200 years, and especially in the last few decades. We have changed the nature of Earth's atmosphere and added a human greenhouse effect on top of natural greenhouse effect. And that's where we're getting into trouble. So what do these do? It's actually really simple physics. The idea is greenhouse gases are transparent. They let solar radiation, visible light, what we can see, right through them, like just a window. You can see right through it. But in infrared radiation, which you and I can't see, it is opaque. The infrared radiation is what Earth gives off to the rest of the universe, and so it can trap that heat in the atmosphere. It kind of works like this. Imagine a version of Earth with no atmosphere at all, like the moon. It would absorb the sun's radiation and warm up. The sun's heating the ground and the ground would warm up. The ground, just obeying the laws of physics, would also give off heat or infrared radiation back to the rest of the universe, out to outer space. And without an atmosphere, this is what it would look like. The sun's heat comes in, Earth heats goes out, and they'd be in perfect balance and we'd be at a temperature that would be accordingly in balance with that. But now let's add an atmosphere, a natural atmosphere. So we have what was the natural greenhouse effect. The idea is as Earth is radiating its heat out into outer space, some of it would be absorbed by the air above it. And some of that would then be re-radiated back down towards the Earth's surface. That has the effect of making the Earth's surface a little bit warmer and the upper atmosphere a little bit colder. 
And that's exactly what Earth has had, and so are mainly all the other planets. Venus, Mars, and others also have a greenhouse effect kind of like that. But then humans come along and we add some more of those gases to the atmosphere. It'd be like adding another blanket on your bed in the wintertime. It traps more heat and keeps you toastier, a little bit warmer, and so on. And so this enhanced greenhouse effect traps a little bit more heat, radiates a little bit more down, and it warms the surface even more. And so far, we've warmed the planet about one degree Celsius. That doesn't sound like a lot, but think about it. During the last ice age, the planet as a whole was only three degrees colder than normal, and it was a totally different planet. This place was under about a mile of ice, in fact. We've warmed the planet in the other direction by about one degree so far, and we're gonna keep going. If we keep going to another two, three, or four degrees, that could be a world we wouldn't even recognize. It would be very, very dangerous for our civilization. So where do these gases come from? Well, I'm sure you've already heard that a lot of them come from burning fossil fuels, right? Burning oil and natural gas and coal and petroleum substitutes and all these things that we have. And that is part of the story. Burning fossil fuels does create CO2 and that causes about 62% of the warming we see on the planet today. So if you forget about everything else, fossil fuels cause more than half of climate change. But that's not all. It turns out that CO2 is also produced by a few other things, including chemistry. In fact, a lot of our industrial processes, especially making cement, releases CO2 into the atmosphere without burning anything at all. It's just kind of industrial chemistry. We also release a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere by burning down trees and deforestation. This green area shows you how much CO2 is caused by burning down forest, which is kind of like burning coal. Coal's dead, trees are alive, but they're both made out of carbon. And you burn them in our atmosphere, you will make carbon dioxide either way. Then we have our next greenhouse gas of methane. Methane is produced by a whole bunch of different things, but the two big sources are agriculture and industry. In agriculture, which is about two-thirds of this methane emissions, is caused largely from cattle. And you've heard all the jokes before, I'm sure, about cow farts. Turns out that's not even true. Cows actually burp methane. They don't fart methane any more than other animals. The other third of this methane comes from industry, especially mining natural gas gas wells, fracking, gas pipelines, even coal mines release methane as well. So we have to think about energy and industry and agriculture to look at methane. Then we've got this stuff called nitrous oxide, which a lot of people don't even think about, but it's a big part of our climate change equation. And nitrous oxide, some of that comes from industry, but again, a lot of it comes from agriculture, especially using too much fertilizer or too much manure on our farmer's fields. And finally, we have F gases, or fluorinated gases, which are chemicals we use as refrigerants and sometimes as insulators in industrial processes. And those refrigerants, like chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, are rising dramatically, and that's why we have to pay attention to this. So putting all those gases together, we emit about 52 gigatons of the equivalent of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere each year. What the heck is a gigaton? It's just a fancy word for a billion metric tons. So we emit 52 billion metric tons of pollution into the atmosphere every year. But there are only seven and a half billion of us. So on average, we're emitting many, many tons of pollution per person into the atmosphere. That's a huge amount. And we're gonna talk more about that and how we can cut that down. Another thing we have to notice is that each of these gases works a little bit differently. Some gases trap more heat than others, like methane and nitrous oxide and those fluorinated gases trap way more heat molecule for molecule than CO2 does. But some gases last longer in the atmosphere than others too, and we've got to take that into account. Like methane, we emit today, most of it will be gone within 10 to 20 years. CO2 we emit today will be in the air for centuries and centuries to come. So we have to look at the strength and lifetime of these different gases. In particular, when we think about methane, methane again is that part of the wedge of our whole diagram of greenhouse gases. If we look at the impact of today's emissions on climate for the next 100 years, 
methane will cause about 16% of that warming over a 100-year period. But if we look at the next 20 years instead, the role of methane doubles and becomes 32%. So it turns out in the near term, our climate changes are gonna be caused by mainly methane and other gases, but in the long term, they're gonna be dominated by things like CO2. So which gas we focus on depends a little bit on what time period of climate change you're really most concerned about. We have to look at all of them. Now that we understand what greenhouse gases are and kind of how they work, we're gonna look at what regulates the level of those gases in the atmosphere, what makes them go up and what makes them go down. To do this, sometimes it's helpful to think of a bathtub. But imagine a bathtub which we can fill and empty with water. We do that every day, right? Pretty simple. When we add water to the bathtub by turning on the faucet, we scientists call that a source. It's a source of water and it levels up the water in the bathtub. We can also remove water by opening up the drain and scientists call that a sink. You'll hear that word a lot about sinks of greenhouse gases. The difference between the sources and the sinks determines whether the water goes up or the water goes down. Sources add and make the water go up. Sinks remove and makes the water go down. Now, if you have a bathtub with the faucet on and the drain open, we have an interesting picture. If the sources are bigger than the sinks, the water level will still go up. But if the drain, the sink, is bigger than the faucet, the source, the water levels will go back down again. So let's take that and apply it to Earth's atmosphere. Well, Earth's atmosphere is basically a big bathtub in the sky. We can fill it with pollution and greenhouse gases, the sources of greenhouse gases, which is largely due to us. And then we have sinks of greenhouse gases, things that pull that pollution out of the sky and put it someplace else. We have sinks on this planet of greenhouse gases, primarily in plants on land, but also in the oceans. So here's the picture. We put pollution in the atmosphere, nature pulls it out in forest and in oceans. Now, right now, our sources of pollution, the stuff we're putting in the atmosphere, is much bigger than what nature can take out. And that's why the levels are going up. But what if we reduced our pollution? What if we brought it down by a half or so? Well, then maybe nature could kind of keep up with it and pull as much pollution out of the atmosphere as we're putting in. If that were to happen, we would hit that moment of drawdown and we'd stabilize CO2 levels and they'd stay flat. But we can go farther and actually reduce our pollution down to zero and pull more carbon and other stuff out of the atmosphere and actually have greenhouse gases decline and stop climate change and begin to reverse in the long term the damage we've done. So this balance between sources and sinks is what will determine the future of our planet and our climate. And let's look at the numbers. In today's atmosphere, we see that we actually have about six major sources of greenhouse gas pollution. We'll go into them later, but you see electricity and food, industry, transportation, buildings, and other stuff. Then we have nature, which on land and in the oceans pull out a total of about 41% of those greenhouse gases, primarily the carbon dioxide part. And that leaves behind 59% of those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, building up year over year over year. So to achieve drawdown, to get them to reverse and bend the curve back down, we've got to work on both sides of this equation. We can work on the sources and bring them down to zero, kind of turning off that faucet over the coming decades, so there's no pollution there at all. And we can also work with the sinks of carbon, starting with the natural ones that already exist, and make sure they can continue to pull that stuff out of the sky. So the idea of getting the drawdown actually will be based on three big principles, and these are important. The first thing we've got to do, and we always need to begin here, is reduce the problem before it even starts. Let's stop pollution before it even gets in the atmosphere so it doesn't cause any problems at all. And that means bringing these emissions down to zero. So we're gonna to have to zoom in and look at what causes these emissions, what's in the economy, what can we do about it in all of these different sectors from electricity to industry to agriculture and beyond. And if we do that, we can cause a big reduction in these things and eventually bring them down to zero. So job number one, stop pollution, bring it to zero. Job number two, we'll be working over in the nature space, basically supporting nature's carbon cycle and maybe even adding to it 
in the form of sinks. That's the right-hand side of this diagram. We'll have to zoom in here and look on land and oceans about what controls their ability to take up carbon and how can we support that and maybe even augment it, making it stronger in the future. So we've looked at the left-hand side and the right-hand side of that big picture, the sources, the sinks, and we know what to do. But there's a third area we've got to talk about too, and we'll get into this later. It's about how, as we improve society, we can do things that, that aren't about climate change. They're things we should do anyway. But when we improve equality and equity and justice around the world, there are things we do there that actually have major secondary climate benefits. So we might get a twofer of improving human rights and equality and contributing to climate solutions. So working together, reducing pollution, supporting nature, and improving society are the three pillars of our climate solution space. Building on these three pillars and pulling them together all at the same time, we actually have all we need to address climate change in the coming decades. And this is gonna be our job over the next few units of this course. I was so pleased to catch up with my old friend Naveen Ramankudi. Naveen is a professor at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, and he's one of the world's leading thinkers on how the food system has to change in order for us to solve some of our biggest environmental problems. So Naveen, thank you so much for joining us today and helping us think a little bit more about climate solutions. But uh, first, I'd really love to get your perspective on kind of the problems around climate change and how it's going to be affecting us. And especially because you think a lot about our food systems and how those work and land use and things we do kind of on the land to sustain ourselves. How does climate change affect all of that? Yeah, I mean, the, the really challenging uh, part about climate change is that uh, there isn't any one thing that's causing climate change. Um, there are you know, a multitude of different actions that uh, humans do run, going through our day-to-day -day lives that affects climate change. Um, so, you know, driving our cars, uh, heating our houses, um, and it turns out also eating our food. Um, and so, you know, I, I always think about the, the idea that, you know, nobody is really causing climate change de deliberately. It's just uh, a, a, an emergent property of uh, our so society as it's currently set up. The solutions to the problem also, uh, in turn, have to deal with the whole, we have to deal with a whole bunch of different issues at the same time. Um, you know, I think you yourself have said that there isn't a silver bullet. Uh, we have to deal with um, energy, we have to deal with uh, land use, we have to deal with food systems, uh, we have to deal with heating, and we have to deal with, you know, um, fl flights and long distance shipping and transportation and so on. Yeah, so that's the challenge. Where do I see possible solutions? I, I, I the thing that's given me hope in the last few years is first, I feel like, you know, while there is so much inertia in our, in our kind of our technological system and our infrastructure and so on, um, the social inertia seems to be moving much faster. Um, you know, obviously we've seen kids on the street uh, who are really asking for, asking our leaders and our, our adults to grownups to be really be grownups and do something about this problem. I'm inspired by that. Um, I'm also inspired by some of the technological solutions too, um, the, the, like, you know, the cost of solar and wind seems to be getting cheaper and cheaper, much faster than people had, all, uh, had anticipated. Um, I see, um, I see uh, my students, a lot of my students are uh, vegan or vegetarian. I um, mean, there's a, there's a, like between generations, we can see these changes happening really rapidly. So that's what gives me some hope. Yeah, that's all great. Uh, well, let me dig in a little bit more on some of the specifics. It's, uh, I'd love to get your expertise on, on this. And as you said, um, you know, the food we eat and the way we grow it and the land we have to clear to, to make this all possible is actually surprisingly to some people, one of the bigger contributors um, from our global economy to climate change. Uh, some of the data we're showing um, looks at like electricity is about a quarter of climate change problem and the larger food systems about a quarter as well, depending how you do the math. Um, but what, within that, what are some of the kind of key issues? Because um, that's a big system. It's like from the farmer's field all the way to our fork and all the way to the landfill. There's a lot of stuff in there. Um, if you had to single out a few things within the food system as kind of the most important to focus on, uh, what would they be or, or some of the bigger solutions? Because there's just so many things being talked about. 
it's hard for people to kind of sort it out and figure out which are the most high impact, high leverage opportunities and the ones that might be good and helpful, but maybe are a little bit low leverage by comparison. I mean, I think the biggest thing is deforestation. You talked about how a quarter of that, uh, of our entire climate change problem comes from the food and land use system. Um, I think about a little less than half of that comes from just CO2 emissions from deforestation. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, we've deforested land for a long time for growing crops. Uh, but if you look at why the majority of deforestation is occurring today, um, it's not really occurring to provide food calories. It's occurring to provide, you know, growing commodities, really. Brazil and Indonesia alone um, contribute to 70% of the deforestation today. Um, and in Brazil, it's mostly for growing soy. And in Indonesia, it's mostly for growing you know, palm oil. Um, so if you can deal with those problems, I mean, we don't, um, we don't, the, most of these crops are going into industrial products or, or as animal feed. So dealing with that is, is one big section, one big chunk. Um, the other food related emissions come from methane emissions from uh, livestock production and cul cultivating rice paddies, um, as well as nitrous oxide emissions from growing fertilizers. There was a study that just that just came out a couple of weeks ago, looking at the global nitrogen cycle, and they pointed out, uh, you know, the, the there's been a big increase in nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture that's not been as um, talked about recently. Um, so again, in terms of solutions, I mean, I think you know a lot of people talk about uh, growing our livestock more sustainably in terms of reducing methane emissions. Um, but the way I think about it is if there is a cow, that cow will emit methane and maybe we can figure out ways to make it reduce, make, make its methane emissions lower by changing the feed or adding feed additives and so on. But that cow is going to emit methane no matter what. So, you know, there's been a lot of attention paid recently to kind of shifting diets. Um, I, I don't necessarily think we all need to become vegan, but even just reducing the amount we eat can make a big difference or I'm eating, eating lower down the food chain, um, eating, you know, more white meat rather than red meat. Coming back to deforestation, that's a huge challenge because, uh, you know, uh, it, it has to come from kind of government policies. I don't think deforestation is a problem that individuals can deal with uh, directly. Um, you know, most people are just earning their living. Um, so, you know, the governments can provide incentives. REDD is a very commonly known uh, kind of international policy for reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation try to provide incentives for, for to set up projects where people are actually paid to either not deforest or to conserve their existing forests. Finally, nitrous oxide emissions, that's a huge challenge. Uh, you know, we grow our food today, uh, our, our kind of current food production relies on nitrogen um, it, it, in a, by a huge amount. About half of our, all the nitrogen that we fix on this planet is for food production. One obvious solution is to make our use of nitrogen more efficient. Uh, currently, we kind of misuse nitrogen in a lot of places. Uh, but again, that's, that's a solution where we need policy. It's not something that consumers can deal with. Uh, it's where we need policies to, uh, broadly speaking, across landscapes where we can incentivize farmers to grow their crops in more nitrogen efficient ways. Yeah, well, so let's dig in a little bit. This is really interesting stuff. So maybe we'll take one of the, each of these in turn, um, one at a time, if you don't mind. So like deforestation, I mean, that, that's kind of shocking to a lot of people. I think what you just said is that like 70% of the deforestation on the planet is in two countries, it's Indonesia and Brazil. Uh, Brazil had lowered their deforestation rate a lot, but now it's kind of shooting back up again due to big changes in policies there. And as you pointed out, these aren't like people clearing land to grow food for like, you know, starving kind of, you know, underprivileged peasants or something like that. This is for global commodity traders and oil palm going to China and, you know, soybeans being fed to pigs halfway across the world or more cattle or something. This is kind of convenience foods and commodities for the middle class of the world, not the world's poor. So that, that's kind of weird. And, and it's also so tightly concentrated. I mean, like 70% like in two countries and what about like three or four commodities as a whole are, wow, what, a, what an amazing opportunity though for the world to focus. It's not like hundred million little power plants and cars. It's like two countries yeah. are most of the problem. That seems like a really good opportunity to me. What can we do about that, do you think? 
obviously the political situation in Brazil right now is not conducive to dealing with that problem very easily. I don't know if I have any good answers. I mean, I had hopes for Brazil before the, uh, before the government changed. I mean, and this is where I think the, the power that consumers have is not in necessarily changing their own behavior, but actually voting for the right people. Uh, that can be hugely powerful, uh, not just in Brazil, but other places around the world as well. Yeah, so the deforestation one is kind of a big picture policy change, but but the policy change is actually fairly strategic. It's like, you know, we don't need every country in the UN to be worrying about deforestation so much. We need these two to get a lot of the quick progress. So I think that's something that we need to rethink a little bit as we think about international agreements and policies like, uh, you know, a UN style agreement of, um, you know, 208 different sovereign nations or whatever may not be always the way we have to solve problems. Sometimes it's bilateral, trilateral kinds of uh, agreements that can get a lot done. I mean, maybe uh, uh, maybe I should talk about uh, kind of some of the glimmers of hope, uh, which might be that, you know, there, there are kind of uh, organizations, uh, companies themselves that are volunteering to kind of source their, uh, their food from, you know, non-deforested land. How effective that is, is probably still up in the air. I mean, obviously Brazil's deforestation has gone back up. Uh, but at least that's hope that people are trying to work outside of the national policy setup to to find out ways where where consumers can have some influence over where their food comes from and that companies are going along with that. Um, so for oil palm, for example, there were there were calls for boycotting oil palm. Uh, a lot of people I know, you know, uh, my parents in law, for example, know that oil palm is an issue. So that's great. There's information that's filtering down to consumers, and hopefully that can filter back. To uh, kind of actions on the ground. Yeah, that was some of the. I mean, that's a really good point because uh, one of the early successes uh, when uh, Brazil did uh, reduce its deforestation rate by like you know seventy to eighty or more a percent, um, that was largely attributed to this kind of a, a commitments by big business in Brazil and international businesses to source their crops from places that weren't deforesting land. And uh, that was done because of big international pressure on companies like Bungie and Cargill and others that, you know, they don't want to be attacked by Greenpeace or whoever all the time. So they realized, hey, we can grow more on the land we've already cleared and leave those forests alone. Uh, so that worked for a long time, but Bolsonaro and the change of government has kind of undermined a lot of that recently. But maybe, maybe there's some lessons still there. But I want to get back to nitrous oxide. Um, you, you know, this is a greenhouse gas like almost nobody even knows exists. And yet it you know it accounts for what probably about three times the effects on climate change that all the flying on earth could possibly do and yet we hear almost nothing about it and when we talk about nitrogen pollution part of it is in the atmosphere nitrous oxide being a greenhouse gas but the other part of the pollution is nitrate that goes into water and that becomes a big pollutant there too for drinking water and ultimately for even like whole ocean ecosystems so kind of managing our nitrogen, we hear all about carbon all day long, but nitrogen, the other little friend on the periodic table is super important as well. And um, what can we do there? We gotta think outside the one, we gotta do more than just one letter at a time, I guess is the <laughs> thing. Uh, again, we become a little bit more fluent in the periodic table. But managing nitrogen turns out to be like a climate problem too. And we never, you know, I don't hear about it that way as much as we should. But what do we think we have to do there? I mean, I think it was uh, Paul Crutzen, right, who first brought our attention to nitrous oxide yep. um, a long time ago. Yeah. So um, I, I remember reading this book by James Gustav Speth uh, called Red Sky in the Morning. I think you probably read that as well. And, you know, he talks about how once we solve the carbon problem, we're going to have a nitrogen problem next. Right? And I think it's something people don't think about very much. I'll, I'll come back to your question in a second. but. It's, I sometimes think about the fact that we focus so much on solving the carbon problem and the climate change problem. And we imagine that that's once that's solved, um, that you know, we'll, be, we'll be all better off. And I think we have to think a bit broader than that about the kind of the cumulative impact of human societies as a whole, um, that we, have, we impact the earth system in multiple ways. You know, one of the kind of thought experiments I sometimes play out in my Head is uh, what happens if uh, you know there's been this promise of nuclear fission for a long time and that we'll have infinite source of you know cheap energy if, if only nuclear fission worked out and I play that thought experiment out and, and it's not very pretty in my head which is that okay we'll probably have 
you know, a lot of energy, but I'm, I'm not convinced that we will use it responsibly. I worry that we'll use that infinite source of energy to kind of deforest the rest of the planet and, you know, uh, add more night. We will have plenty of energy to, you know, accelerate the Haber-Bash process even more. We'll fix even more nitrogen. We'll have even more nitrous oxide emissions. So, yeah. So I think solving the carbon problem without thinking about our, you know, broader societal metabolism is, is, is uh, maybe a little, it can have pitfalls. So coming back to nitrous oxide, it, it, that's a really challenging problem. I mean, it, it's, I, I think what somebody estimated, I can't remember the number, something like uh, 2 billion people are, are, have been fed over the last 50 years purely because of nitrogen. I can't remember the numbers, right? So it, it had a huge impact on society in terms of increasing our food production. Um, how are we going to reduce that? Uh, so people talk about using, you know, we, well, maybe we don't use synthetic fertilizer. We can use organic fertilizers or compost and all of that. That, that does have benefits in the sense that we are not creating new kind of reactive nitrogen. We are not using Haber brush process, but we are trying to recycle nitrogen. Um, so that can be a good thing. But they still meant nitrous oxide, manures and compost, yes, that's the same chemistry. They're still going to, yeah, they're still, that's the thing. You're still, you're applying a different form of nitrogen and you're still going to have the leaching problem. You're still going to have the nitrous oxide problem. You're recycling it and using it more efficiently, but. We just have to use less of it. And um, I mean, our, our colleague, Nathan Mueller, you know, you and I've worked with in the past, actually did some nice estimates of like, it's kind of the ultimate Goldilocks problem. Uh, there are some parts of the world that don't have enough nitrogen in the soil. And there are some places that have too much that becomes a pollution problem. And there are only a handful of places that get it just right. I think there were like Australia and Brazil kind of had like the more optimum amount of fertilizer being used that was actually really efficiently used to grow the most crops you could get. But the US, India, China, and other countries use so much more, like two or three times the fertilizer the plants could ever possibly use up because there's just bad policies and nobody pays the cost for that. And that pollutes the waterways and contributes to climate change. Um, so, you know, there, there are probably some pretty obvious things we could do, but they do need some policy backups, maybe how we think about crop insurance and how we subsidize agriculture needs to be adjusted to have more of a kind of a public good in mind. I don't know. What do you think about that? That's yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's a great point, which is that and I, if you, if you use crop insurance, we have to incentivize the right behavior, right? So the right now, the way we've set up crop insurance is that we incentivize, we essentially provide a floor for farmers uh, to, to you know, have losses. But the crop insurance is not tied to, not necessarily tied to, you know, better environmental outcomes. Um, so it, it's so essentially, if you crop insurance is, is if you have a weather shock, if you have a drought or a, you know, you have some kind of shock, uh, you you get some kind of price support. So I often think about we need biological insurance more than kind of you know financial insurance. Uh, we need to build systems that are much more resilient and much more environmentally friendly. And how we do that, um, there's there's a big debate about that. Some people talk about using you know more di diversification, um, using you know uh, growing more legumes within your crops so that you don't have to apply as much nitrogen, uh, using more crop rotations um, and yeah and stuff like that. Um, Nathan Muller's study was interesting. Uh, you know, we I think uh, we estimated that we can increase food production by thirty percent with only a nine percent increase in N, which is great. But I think about that later, and I was like, well, you're still increasing N. We are not decreasing N, right? Like we're doing it more efficiently. But we probably need to bring nitrogen use down to maybe half or even less. Yeah. Uh, how we are going to do that? I, 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 yeah, that's a huge challenge. Well, one of the things you mentioned too, of course, is um, kind of larger demand side parts of the equation. You know, we always like to talk about how we produce stuff in a new way. I don't know, maybe it's just sexier, but you know, half the story, whether it's energy or food is often about the efficiency of what we already grow and already produce. So, um, you know, we, we're gonna talk a lot about in this class around food waste and diets, um, which are kind of, obvious, but still underexploited changes, um, especially food waste. We just don't seem to do enough or talk enough about that. Uh, so I'll have to explore that with you as well. But also in the diet things, um, like, you know, there's kind of a simplify your diet and get the red meat out a little bit more plant rich, things like this. But then there's all this excitement about, you know, alternative meats and, you know, being 
high-tech solutions to what could be a low-tech problem in some ways. Um, I don't know, maybe maybe we need it all, but what are your perspectives on this? You're really one of the world's leading experts on these issues. What, what are some of the... Um, yeah. What are some of the things you think about when you think about kind of reducing the pressure on the food system so we don't have to push it so hard? Yeah, thanks for asking that. Yeah, we tend to focus a lot on thinking about the supply side, like how can we produce our food better? But there's always a question of, do we need to produce all this food? Um, and uh, the World Resources Institute, I think you probably know about this, their report that came out last year, they have this nice figure where they lay out a set of different, I think it was like 17 different solutions to address the climate change problem, but also the food problem. Um, and, you know, they, they kind of, uh, they, I, don't, I don't think it's ranked, but if you look at the, their portfolio of different solutions, I think they call it different menus. If you look at the menu that's focused on improving efficiency in the agricultural system, yeah, it's important. But it's not the big leverage. The big leverage are the first two in their, in their list, which is food waste and shifting diets. And in their suite of 17 solutions, those two, I think, are about 40% of the entire solution set. So that's huge. Um, so it's similar to what uh, Drawdown finds, too, when we look at all the different solutions we've looked at um, and a similar kind of, you know, different way of calculating them and stuff. But the numbers sort of, you know, match up pretty similarly. Yeah. It's like when you lose a third of the food, that means probably about a third of the greenhouse gases are right sitting there anyway. And then when you've got a food like red meat that takes, you know, 30 times the calories of plants to grow it to get one calorie of beef, you got a big leverage point there. These are yeah. just inevitably yeah. very yeah. big um, yeah. levers in the system is waste and yeah. red meat. Yeah. So um, why are we focusing so, more on that? I mean, I think I would say in the last couple of years that shifted the conversation around that. All right. And before I let you go, dear listener, I just want to let you know next week there will be a very substantive conversation that I will be airing about the ongoing fight against AGRA once again. Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. If you didn't already know, that organization is pushing hard to crush the thousand year practice of agroecology in order to make a profit on the continent of Africa. So tune in next week, get yourself informed. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guest, Matthew Simmons, for that very important update on Jackson Demonstration State Forest. Again, you can go to pomolandback.com, pomolandback.com, or savejackson.org, savejackson.org. Dot org. Nobody sweeter than Peter on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Stay tuned for a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! coming up next. And remember, good people, embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you for listening. This is a community announcement. You can join the Tony Award-winning San Francisco Mime Group as it opens for its 63rd season of free shows with their 2022 show, Back to the Way Things Were. Middle-aged liberals Ralph and Alice wistfully yearn for the before time when things seem normal. Back to the Way Things Were is performed in the characteristic and unique singing and dancing political style of the San Francisco Mime Troupe. Performances take place in Bay Area parks through September 5th. For a complete schedule or more information, visit sfmt.org or call 415-285-1717. The community calendar is produced by the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Please send your wheelchair-accessible listing to calendar at kpfa.org. To hear this information again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621, or view it online at kpfa.org. KPFA is America's original listener-supported radio station. Yes, we're the place on the dial that speaks truth to power, but we're also a music discovery platform. Music is part of the genetics of KPFA. We connect Bay Area music lovers to genres that inspire creativity. Help us continue to share the magic of jazz, blues, rock, funk, R&B, gospel, world, and classical music by making a donation at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, 94.3 K232FZ in Monterey, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.